it's freaking here for you too. You just got to get up, get the information, make the, make the best decisions for you and stop trading your long-term success for short-term gains in the moment. Oh my God. If, if, by the way, if you're listening to this and you're not driving, I hope you just took out a notebook or something (laughs) or (laughs) wrote down half of what Candy just said. Hey Candy, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Of course, anytime. So tell us a little bit about who you are. I know my listeners just heard the intro, but I love guests to just introduce themselves and say hi. Yeah. So the the summary notes, I guess, would be I've been building businesses since I was 19. I grew up in a really small town. Uh, I grew up in a trailer, two teenage parents, um, super blue collar, and just watched how people can work really hard. Uh, my mom and dad, my, my dad's a mechanic. My mom cleaned houses when I was a kid. And, you know, through that education, I basically learned entrepreneurship, which you and I just were chatting about before we started. And, you know, it wasn't like a big deal to start a business at 19 and my first company. And I've gone on to build multiple since then. I now teach entrepreneurship from that 20 plus year experience and have a nonprofit that I started back East as well, because I've always had a heart to give back. And now I just basically, you know, try to shorten the gap for other people. I've wrote a book, as you know, and um, share a lot of content online of the things that the gritty real world way of how you actually build a business and not a lot of the smoke and mirrors that you tend to hear about. Wait, you mean I can't just like manifest my dreams <laughs> and build a business with ease and grace? That's not a thing? <laughs> I, right. I, I think that it's like, I always say that, I think this is in the book, it's like, think and get rich will only get you so far. You also have to do to become wealthy. And that is like basically the entire point of what I've done is it's not just sit on your couch and wait for something to happen. It's like, yes, visualize. Yes, think about it. Yes, but you also got to put in the implementation and execution because that's what's going to build the life of your dreams. Yeah. I think one of my coaches put it like take furious action. I thought that was pretty powerful. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that is good. I love it. Um, so you're, you're one could, one could argue you were born to be an entrepreneur. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how entrepreneurship kind of entered into your life and how it's been part of it? Yeah. So you figure my dad was 24 years old. I was five. Um, my mom was 16 when she had me. So my dad was 19 when he found out he was going to be a dad and he had just got fired from his job and he was driving down the street and he had $200 in his pocket. And I was five years old, didn't know this whole story. And he saw a sign that said for rent, garage for rent. And he stopped in. He said to the lady, how much? She said $400. He said, I have $200 in my pocket. Let me get through two weeks and I'll pay you the rest. And she agreed. And so when I was five years old, my dad started his first auto mechanic shop in this really small town. He's a self-taught ninth grade education, learned how to be a mechanic. And so most kids that get dropped off at dance or recite, you know, sports or soccer or something like that. I got dropped off at my dad's garage every day from the time I was in kindergarten until I could drive. So that 11 year education of answering the phones, typing on a typewriter, because I'm that old, (laughs) you know, watching cartoons after school on a little 13 inch TV in the office and, you know, having an afternoon snack out of the vending machine and, and seeing him work with customers and, and not have all the answers, but still figure it out was the greatest life lesson. You know, a lot of times we had customers that would come in and I would hear them say like, oh, we feel, I'd hear them talking like, we feel so bad for her that she's coming here after school. But it one was all I knew. And two gave me just such a, um, an education that I couldn't buy. So that's probably why I think, you know, entrepreneurship was definitely, I was born that way. I had a little golf ball business when I was a kid. I was, you know, all these different things like most entrepreneurs, but really what it is, is it's learning the real things, learning how to work with customers, learning that business is literally, you either increase your sales or decrease expenses, like taking the really core business fundamentals and, and stripping away all of the other noise that we tend to hear And realizing that it's in all of us. Like even if someone loves their job, they can still start a business on the side and open themselves up to tax deductions and earn more money. So um, I definitely think even though I had a unique experience, it's it's something that's available to everyone. That's amazing. And um, about your education too, do you have any like formal business education after all of that, you know, practical education? 
No. So I was originally going to go to college. I had a scholarship to Ohio State University. I wanted to be a criminology major, wanted to be in the FBI, like hard right turn from (laughs) what I do now. (laughs) But I wasn't a big fan of school. Like I just wanted to get out and do something and, and it just wasn't for me. So I didn't actually fulfill that. I gave up my scholarship and then started a business at 19. So other than a high school diploma, that's it. (laughs) That's all I got. Well, Candy, if you change your mind, I heard the IRS is hiring. So <laughs> yeah, a lot of people. There's always, there's always that. <laughs> I can still work for the government. So um, so on that note, too, because we were talking about this before, and if you guys aren't following Candy on social media, you're missing out because like, I'll give my personal endorsement as a CPA. Like, The stuff she says is actually correct. <laughs> so there's a lot of the, like, the tax strategies, and you dare to go there. I think a lot of... like business influencers, if you want to call it that, like folks who speak about business online coaches, they don't touch the tax stuff. They don't touch the like, you know, those types of strategies because they're like, Ooh, I'm not a CPA. I'm not qualified. But like, you've been through it. You've implemented, you've seen it work and you're able to speak to those things. Um, even though you don't have that, you know, three letter credential, which is totally fine because you're doing it in a way that's like very practical and useful. Where did you find like, I'll call it a passion, but I know it's not really the best word, but like, where did you, where did you develop a curiosity and an interest in that type of subject, especially given like most people just act like they're allergic to tax stuff? Yeah. So (laughs) I always look at it as data, like Mm -hmm. in order to make an informed business decision or even an investing decision, like we need to remove our feelings because our feelings are not facts and we need to look at the data. And so anything that's number related, that's going to tell you far more about the health of your business than anything else, than any instinct that you may have, or, you know, certainly that has a place, but really evaluating your numbers. And when I started to really dive into my KPIs, my business metrics, like really understanding taxes, I could then make better decisions in my business. Because oftentimes people are doing a very reactive situate, like they're acting reactively to their taxes as opposed to proactively. And I realized, well, if I let that, that clock strike midnight on, you know, December 31st, I now don't have a lot of options that I can do to reduce my taxes. So I started to really learn and ask questions and get curious. And, and then I just tend to observe patterns. I've just always been good at that. So I just kind of like take that information, see where it applies And yeah, like you said, anything that I post, it's not just my experience. A lot of times people post things that they heard, right? A lot of business coaches or business influencers, as you called them, have never actually had a business, maybe other than an early stage business. And they certainly haven't had multiple companies and led large teams. So I definitely come from a a place of experience, but then I also do research. Like I'm going to make sure that this tax law is still applicable in 2022 before I just regurgitate it on the internet. Um, so I'm very data heavy and very research based with anything that I do, but business, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And we appreciate that as professionals too, because we also <laughs> see a lot of, we see a lot of the stuff that's just regurgitation and we're like, but no, but not quite. And yeah. we've even talked about some of those things on the show, like trying to dispel the rumors that are going around that are being spread. So I just appreciate anyone who's putting out that content to neutralize that and say, no, this is how it actually is. Um, but let's get into, let's just talk about wealth building for a second, because we know that keeping more of what you earn, which is the name of the show, right? Keeping more of what you earn is a key path to that through taxes and tax strategy. But what do you think are the things that most folks overlook as they're trying to build wealth? Because I think that most people have a pursuit of wealth, but they're missing some pieces along the way. Yeah. So I always say kind of to your point and the name of the show, it's not just what you make. It's also what you keep. And Mm -hmm. so that's where part of the six habits within Wealth Habits is also focusing on what you keep because you have to save more in, in order to be able to build more wealth. You have to be able to earn more, which is where the business comes in, in order to build more wealth. You have to be able to invest more. So I think what most people miss on their way is understanding how taxes work within earned income and investing income. And knowing that rather than spending, I always say, rather than going out and and buying the Louis bag or the Gucci shoes, go buy the stock, let the stock appreciate, invest your money into cash flowing assets so that then when that that asset is cash flowing, whether it's real estate or a stock portfolio, then you can go buy whatever you want. But I think our society is so focused on instant gratification, but I'm literally a living testament. You, you can do the instant gratification all day long. What I did was I chose to do things when I was in my 20s 
that my friends weren't willing to do because they were out partying and having fun. There's nothing wrong with that, but that was their path. But now that I'm in my 40s, I get to do things that most people can't do, which is choose to just in the middle of the day, be on a podcast and hang out or go for lunch or, or go walk with my dog, whatever it might be, because I played the long game. And I think that that's what a lot of people miss is taking their earned income, investing their earned income, having a rental portfolio so that then they can actually open themselves up to tax savings, understand cash flow, no appreciation, asset appreciation, and then be able to, to have less go out and bleed money out of your bottom line. Because aside from debt, which is the number one destroyer of your wealth, taxes is the second. And if you don't understand that, you're going to leave a lot of money on the table that literally the, the major, as you know, the massive corporations have all these lobbyists and people that they can try to get all these tax loopholes. We, as a business owner, we're just the beneficiaries of it. But if we don't know it, we can't take advantage of it and we'll end up spending far more than we need. Yeah. And on that note, I would love your thoughts on something because this comes up all the time with either our guests or folks I speak to online. And that's the, well, I mean, I pay my fair share right? And my, my mentality, which you, you all know, listening to the show is, well, don't leave a tip though. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but don't leave a tip. They haven't earned it. Uh, what would you say are, what, what was the gateway for you? Because especially without like, without, again, you don't have a degree in business or, or any like natural exposure to this type of stuff. How did you get curious and into that? Were there any like you know, resources, professionals, or someone who helped you along the way that really made a difference in how you see the subject of taxes? Yeah. So, you know, I, I feel like I had a um, doctorate degree in business before I actually turned 16 because of like all of those years being dropped off at my dad's business totally. and then doing it myself. Like the, we always learn, we either learn from our mistakes or we learn from mentors. And sometimes it's a combination of both. And I would say when it really shifted for me, I was about two years into my business. I had just bought an investment property at 21 years old and it was in foreclosure. And I decided that I was going to have, I was going to make a rental so that I could have pass passive cash flowing because I read a book when I was, that's what we were supposed to do. So I was just like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Like wealth was not a topic obviously at our house. So when I read this book, I'm like, this makes sense. Let's do it. So but I realized I didn't like being a landlord while I was running a business. I just, you know, I did, I, I'm, I had my business on my own. There was nobody, no partners, nobody else involved. And that now I'm trying to be a landlord and it was just too much. So I sold it and made a lot of money flipping the property. And then when I got my tax bill, I had to owe so much money. And I was like, wait a minute. Like I already paid in all my quarterlies, like everything should be fine. And that was when I learned between short-term gains, long-term gains, and all the differences. And I was like, okay, I will never make that mistake again because not only did I owe more, but then because of the sale of that property, I got thrown into the highest tax bracket possible. So now all of my business income, I earned, I had to pay more. So right. that was a very expensive lesson to pay attention to what matters. So then I learned, well, how do I avoid this? And I just started asking questions. I think when you're in your 20s, you're okay asking questions because you feel like you don't have to know everything. And then I think sometimes when people get into their 30s, 40s, 50s, they feel like they shouldn't ask because they're afraid to look stupid or afraid that somebody's going to think less of them. But you don't know what you don't know. So if you just ask the questions, you can learn from other people a lot more quickly and less expensive than if you learn from your mistakes. So that's when I just started asking questions. And every time I would meet with my CPA, I'd be like, well, why? Why? Like, why are we doing that? How? How? How could we do this less? And then I just started to really pay attention and have quarterly meetings so that I was always up to date on where I was so that I wasn't ever going to have a big tax bill without me knowing ahead of time that it was coming. Oh, totally. And the way we phrase that to our clients is like, you want to have a quarterly board meeting with all of the voices you want in your ear, which includes somebody who's like, Hey, there's tax implications of all this stuff. Right. Yeah. Or getting that instinct that when something's going to happen in your life, whether it be like selling a home, you know, selling a business, like a business took off, business is slow, whatever it is, having that check in kind of like a doctor to be like, Hey, this is what's going on. And this is what it's going to look like at the end of the year. That is insanely powerful. And I'm glad that you know, you took on that habit too, because that's what we always advocate for. Now, um, when it comes to, you know, building wealth and, you know, establishing wealth, what are some of the, and uh, along that line, when you said kind of like being curious and asking more questions, what are some of the questions that folks should be asking? Are there any examples of really good questions that will help them 
sort of unpack where they need to be going next when they feel kind of lost or they feel, I don't have any background in this. I don't know what to do. What should I do? And it's really about asking good questions to your point. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the stuff I share, I've shared that with you. It's like, I just really want to elevate the conversation around this so that even if people are like, I don't know if that applies to me, they can, they know enough to ask the questions. And so I think it's important to remember if we just kind of go back, because I think a lot of times people hear things like this and they're like, well, you know, they, they self analyze themselves out. Like, well, I didn't have that experience as a child, or, well, I didn't do this, or I wasn't paying attention, or I do have debt, or I owe a big tax bill. I think first it's important to realize that anyone listening can create financial freedom and wealth by doing very ordinary, boring things. Like there is nothing that I did that was unique and special. I'm not that smart. I wasn't that connected. I had no education, no money, but it's available for everyone if you're willing to do the work. So I think what's important is to first establish that so that anyone listening can get rid of the bullshit that's in their head and can start self like crossing off these lists to say, no, this is available for you too. And so I think that's important. What are some of the ordinary things? Making sure that first the BS that's in your mind, that you can address that because we all have these scripts that are running from our childhood, maybe from your early teens, maybe from your early 20s, that maybe you made some mistakes. And oftentimes that trips people up because they think, well, I did this, so I can't have this. Building wealth is not about where you've been. It's about where you're going. So where you want to go is always has to be your focus and you can't address what you've already done. What's been done is done. We need to move on. So that's first figuring out what exactly is running in your mind and how can we get past that crap so that you can just do the very ordinary things to build wealth. That's really first. The second is where are you right now? Like, could you save 20% of your income right now? And if this is a very easy way to know if you're overspending, because if anyone listening says, oh my gosh, I could not, I couldn't, I couldn't save 20% or invest 20% of my income right now. That means that you're overspending because you're not paying Mm -hmm. yourself and your investments first and you're buying the house, the car, the motorcycle, the boat, whatever. And you have so much going out that you actually can't invest in your future. So that's, that's the, that's the second step really. Can you invest 20%? And if the answer is no, it's just like business. You either have to increase your income or decrease your expenses. And which is it for you? Can you go through and make some hard decisions about reducing your spending or do you need to do something on the side or look for another position or start a, start a business or grow your business in order to earn more? And that's really the third step, earning more money so that you can then invest more money. And then kind of the fourth is what comes in with what you do is, you know, saving more, saving on your taxes, making sure that you're saving in your expenses so that if gas goes up to six bucks a gallon or we do fall into a recession, that you're not struggling to buy organic raspberries and you have to change your eating habits and your shopping habits, right? Because you're, you're spending so much money and you're not investing and you're not saving, making sure that you have an emergency fund that falls in line with the saving your way to more wealth. Yeah. And then of course, investing your way, you know, making sure that you are diversifying those investments, that you are looking at having a conversation with your accountant, your, your bookkeeper. Sometimes these are all different people with your financial planner, making sure that you are up to date. Like I'll give an example. Um, you were just saying this, but like, if you, here's what will happen if you don't, I had a client that was exiting his company. He tells me after contracts were signed. Now I'm not as even a CPA, but I was his advisor in the whole deal. He said, Oh Mm -hmm. yeah, we've already done, you know, the buyers in place, this, that I'm like, awesome. Okay. Well, let's look at let's look at everything and how it's structured. He wasn't structured properly in the beginning. So he ended up losing his, am I allowed to swear? Oh yeah, of course. You've already <laughs> okay. said bullshit a couple of times. <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> he lost. We're good. I should have asked that in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> You're all good. He lost his ass in taxes because as you know, if you're set up different ways, right? And how you structure mm-hmm. it, asset sale, share sale, you could end up owing a lot of money. So you want to make sure that you have those conversations ahead of time and then really making sure that you're diversifying your investments. And that's something that anyone can do. And if it's kind of a scary conversation, it's just like anything that you want to learn. If you want to be better at golf, you're going to take lessons and and you're going to do it more. If you want to be better at your money and you want to get better at investing, you need to research more. You need to have better conversations. You need to drown out the music and the hip hop rap, and you need to put on some financial podcasts and learn learn about the topics, right? It's all out there. 
Um, but learning your way is another really important key. Yeah, I love that because I think what you what you decide to envelop yourself in is what you'll you'll absorb. It's true. And also people will identify as like, I'm not a numbers person. I never learned this. I know. And they, they create identity and permanence to those statements. And what I wish people understood, it's almost like saying I'm fat. Mm -hmm. Like it's like, you can lose weight. Like you can get healthy. You're still in control of what you do from this day forward. And it's no different than with money because you can absolutely change the outcome. If you just change this, you can change your own circumstances. You really can. Yeah. But well, if you and blame that, it's just going to dig you deeper. A hundred percent. And what it becomes is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You say mm. that you're not good with this. You say that you're going to leave it to someone else. Guess what? None of us, unless you grew up in a very, very, very small 1% of families that you started to hear about wealth and money and investing at a young age, which is not the norm. I would say it's probably less than 2% of Americans. Unless you grew up in one of those, nobody knows about this shit. So you're totally with everybody else not knowing, but you not knowing isn't an excuse to not start. And that's where it's the difference. Understand that you, I didn't know when I started, but I wanted to know because here's the thing. Numbers affects all of us. We all make money. We all have bills. We all spend money. So every single human alive has to deal with numbers. It's whether you want to develop your AQM around it or whether you just want to be ignorant to the fact and wash your hands of it. The choice is absolutely yours and it's okay to do both. But I would assume if you're listening to this podcast that you do have a desire to keep more of what you make and build wealth. And I think that that's just to listen to this, even this far is commendable on its own. So I'm just proud of your listeners who's already listening. <laughs> Me too. I love that. They're still listening you know, a year later and we do five episodes a week and the people still listen. So I'll keep talking about this stuff until, you know, as long as they're willing to keep listening. Uh, and I think it's just so powerful to hear that from you too, because like, to put it bluntly, like you, you had all the, all the excuses in the world, if you wanted to use them to say, well, I'm not really cut out for this. I was, I, you know, I didn't really, you know, but you, you went ahead and absorbed the knowledge. You were able to, to kind of write your own story and say, this is how I want to succeed. And I'm going to utilize this, but it's also kind of using the how do I like using your story to actually empower yourself as opposed to using it to pull yourself down? Like you said, with that self, self-fulfilling prophecy, it's how are you going to use this to, to lift yourself up? Yeah. Right? And, and here's the thing. Every single person listening has experienced something that would give them the excuse to quit if they wanted. Yeah. Every single person, one out of six females su suffer sexual abuse as a child. I was one of them. There are so many women that are in domestic violence relationships. There are so many men that have had experiences and things happen or horrible father figures or none at all. And every single person has a reason to quit. And that also is the exact same reason that you have the excuse to continue because it doesn't have to stop with you. It, you can be the first. You can be the first millionaire. You can be the first billionaire. You can be the first business owner. You can be the first person to change the script that was around your generational family forever. And it's all in what you want to do. I always say circumstance happens to us and we have a choice. In one half of one second, our subconscious brain will kick in and it'll try to keep us from pain. But what we don't realize is that if we walk through that pain, that that pain or that trauma that we experience oftentimes is pointing us to the direction that we need to go. It's oftentimes not the like, it's not the block, it's the compass. And so rather than choosing to go down the victim spiral, which ultimately leads to regret, you can choose to take that same exact thing and turn it into a rock to stand on and be able to get one step closer and one step higher to whoever you were made to be. And I, I truly believe that's why the last habit is about generosity and contribution, because it's really the key. Like if I didn't first build wealth, people hear, oh, she talks about money. She's all about money. It's all about what money can do and how the, cre the, the freedom that it can create and the generosity and contribution that it can create. If I didn't first have money or build wealth, I wouldn't have been able to start a nonprofit at 26. I wouldn't have been able to buy a building at 25 and donate it to the nonprofit. We wouldn't have saved thousands of animals' lives and I wouldn't have raised millions of dollars for charity because of my connections and relationships in business. That's what it's all about. 
it's not just about accumulating the bunch of boats and then going off into the sunset and, and meeting your maker at some point and realizing that you missed out on the lessons that you were supposed to learn when you were here. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because I think there's also a life lesson in the journey of creating wealth and realizing that it's freaking here for you too. You just got to get up, get the information, make the, make the best decisions for you and stop trading your long-term success for short-term gains in the moment. Oh my God. If, if, by the way, if you're listening to this and you're not driving, I hope you just took out a notebook or something <laughs> or <laughs> wrote down half of what Candy just said. I hope that they use that clip because <laughs> that was, that's completely on point. And so many times people associate wealth with greed. They so well they associate wealth with like the rich person in the movie, which is always the villain. The you know the wealthy are greedy, but in reality, it's like the wealthy have resources, and what they choose to do with those resources really shows their character. And I think that if you if you are striving to accumulate wealth, that generosity has to be an element of what that's for. There has to be a why behind it, and there also has to be a very powerful why because to your point. If you're going to be the first, if you're going to break generational habits, then there has to be a really powerful reason as to why you're going to do that. And even more so, that should be a driver for like, wow, what impact am I going to make? Because that's a fire under your ass like crazy. When you can, when you go that far and you're going to launch and skyrocket and break those different, you know, generational curses, like that's going to be a very powerful why. And I think that's going to be a really good reason to be generous and to be more, how do I say it? Like just be able to share your wealth more and to have it impact more people. I've noticed the most generous people happen to be the wealthiest and vice versa. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting because if wealth is the goal, you miss the point. I have in the book when I did a bunch of studies on some of the, mo the wealthiest people that also committed suicide. They were mm. trying to get certainty and they were trying to get significance. Like a lot of these six human needs that Tony Robbins has adapted from, you know, Maslow and all of these other great um, scientists and philosophers that discovered this whole thing. And it's like, if you are going after the wrong things, you will never feel fulfilled. The most lit up, alive, hungry that I've ever been was for things that I did not directly benefit from. I've never taken a dime from our nonprofit. It's cost me far more than I even knew in the beginning when I created it. It was probably one of the biggest business mistakes I ever made because it really took my eye off of what I was doing, but it was the best life decision I ever made. Because what it does is, you know, when you're broke and you're poor and you have debt, you have leverage, you have a reason to show up, a reason to be hungry. But when you start to accumulate wealth, it is really easy to let your foot off the gas and kind of coast and get comfortable because now life is kind of comfortable. Actually, the studies show that anyone that makes $75,000 or more, that your basic needs are met and the in increase in happiness and fulfillment over that amount is very insignificant which is why when you go after the path to do hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of dollars, that if you don't have something else that you're tied to, you will coast. So what I did was consciously make sure that I always said, no, my why was to be able to save, you know, I have a pit bull right over here, like that's a foster, you know, like to be able to save the, the animals that need it, to be able to help kids that didn't have maybe the experience that I had, or to be able to show them that they can heal and provide hope. And so to me, that's what has kept me hungry too, to be able to give more, do more, become more, and just help and serve more people. It's why exiting in 2019, I can now do, I could not do all of these things and help people learn entrepreneurship and business because I was so in it. But because then I did it, I'm, ac I'm actually able to help far more people than I ever was in the first 20 years of business. And it's so powerful. And one of the ways you're helping people is with this book that is now out as of the time, as of the time this is being uh, aired, I believe. Yes. You can so tell me. Just, so I it's believe it's out. coming out now. Yep. November 15th. Um, and really I wanted to write it for two reasons. One, I feel that books helped me so much as a kid, you know, because I wasn't, my parents were teenagers and, you know, had a, a limited education. So a lot of times I felt like I was on my own, you know, it was a different, most, you know, um, family structures, you know, you kind of have like a hierarchy of the parents and the kids, but 
because we were, they were so young, it was almost like we grew up together. So like my dad, we're super close, but it's a different type of family structure than most people have. And so I learned, leaned on books a lot and read books a ton in order to really understand a lot of these principles. And so I wanted to do that. And then the second part was all the books I read were from men. There wasn't a single book about wealth and money and business that was on my bookshelf in my office when I was 19. They were all from guys. And, and that's great. But I'm like, is the world maybe ready? Like, has generations gone on enough that we're finally ready to hear about wealth and investing from a female? And literally had the conversation with my publisher and, and they were like, we think the world's finally ready. We're, who knows? We'll see how the book does to know if it's really ready for the woman about wealth. But I do yeah. think that, you know, men and women handle money differently. We actually see money. And I'm sure you know this, like, but in a lot of our studies that we did, like, it doesn't say that, you know, women can, can only learn from women and men can only learn from men. Like, there's a lot that we can learn from each other. But this is really an accumulation of what I've done over 20 years and why anybody can do it. You don't have to innovate the electric car. Like you don't have like, you, you know, Warren Buffett, one of the most uh, wealthiest people in America, never actually created anything. He's an investor, you know, and now granted, he's a really smart dude. I'm nowhere near that smart. But anyone can create wealth just by doing the principles that we were never taught. So I just wanted to break down everything very simply so that anyone, regardless of their education, their background, the family that they came from or where they live right now, that they too have access to financial freedom. Cause that's really what, that's really when life starts to get sweet. It's not about the money. It's about the freedom that you can have because of it. Yeah. And I think it's super powerful that, you know, coming from your voice, I know that more people, especially women can relate to you and would be open to hearing about your story because they can't relate to all the men that are writing these books or they even feel more distanced. And then they create more of those stories like, well, it's not for me. And I think that this will break down that excuse too. So in your mission to basically bulldoze everyone's excuses, <laughs> you just knocked another one off too. <laughs> Perfect. Amazing. Candy, thank you so much for this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And it's so refreshing to hear other folks, especially those who have gone out, done it and walked the walk, you know, supporting the stuff that we say on the show and saying, yes, it works. It absolutely <laughs> works. Yes. Keep listening to the show because it does work and it matters. <laughs> like even if you don't have a business, this is still really important stuff. Like taxes aligns with personal finances and, and making sure mm -hmm. that you get a handle on your spending and on what you're earning and really creating your own quote board of directors of your life. Like, you know, who are those people that you want a front row seat to help you build wealth? You can read the books and you can do all of that, but you're also going to need people in your life on an annual basis that will help you along and who you choose is going to be really important. So I'm glad that all the listeners are here and listening to you because it is rare to, to talk to someone that we actually are in alignment. I talk to a lot of CPAs and they're like, oh, I don't know if we should do, you know, so-and-so should do that. And I'm like, why? Like, oh, a home office is a red flag, but they actually have a home office. Like, so why are we no. going to leave it on the table if we could substantiate the claim? So oh, and it hasn't been, the problem is it hasn't been a red flag since 1992 when we had basically, you know, AOL was coming out and nobody even had a computer in their house. So it was impossible to have a home office. So yeah, like, like they're just sticking with, it's kind of like how our music taste ends around like age 25. Like we just don't accept any new music off the radio and we think it's all garbage, right? Yeah. Every CPA kind of got that to a point where they were like, this is how it is. And like haven't changed their minds since. And I think that we have a new generation ushering in that is kind of getting it now and, and willing to talk about these different things. And much like what you were saying, I think that you articulated it so well, where the, you know, it's coming from a certain voice and having that voice in your ear, especially as a woman, that's what we're trying to do with this show. So if you don't have a financial person on your board of directors in your life, at least we are in your ears and we can serve that role for now. And yes. we can say, this is what you should be listening to and having influence you as you're building your business. And I'm so grateful, Candy, that you're adding to that voice. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and tell us, you know, other than the book, where can folks find out more about you, follow along and hear more of this gold that you have to offer? Yeah. So I'm on TikTok and Instagram are my two biggest platforms at Candy Valentino. And of course, the book is wealthhabitsbook.com events and all of the other things are at candyvalentino.com. But just thanks so much for having me on and, and for you being a voice in this space as well. Because anyone listening to this, you're going to hear and learn so much more. Like, think of this. Does what I'm doing right now add more money to my bottom line? 
Does it add more to my health, whether that's physically, spiritually, or emotionally, or does it create joy in my life? And if it's not one of those things, literally stop doing it right now. If it doesn't increase your wealth, your health, or your bottom line, like it is not for you. So something to think about, but thank you so much for for having me on. I appreciate it. Of course. All right. We'll see you on the next episode. 